Right, here we go. So we're going to count down five big mm. polling disasters in history. We're going to start with the 1936 presidential election. We are fighting, fighting to save a great and precious form of government for ourselves and for the world. And so I accept the commission you have tendered me That was, that sounded like a gun going off at the end. That was Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, giving a speech ahead of the 1936 US election. He went on to win a massive landslide, uh, the biggest landslide since the 1850s, but the polling was wrong. Yeah, that's right. So the Literary Digest was the premier pollster of the time, and they did what to us to now seems a really crude thing of basically getting their readers to tell them who they were going to vote for. <laughs> But it had worked for several... A bit Daily Express website, yeah, that, isn't it? But it had worked for several presidential elections in a row, and they made a real virtue of how they had millions of people responding to their poll, their survey. They'd got it right several times in a row. But in '36, they predicted a Republican landslide. As you say, it was actually a Democrat landslide. And three, what we would now call modern scientific pollsters, had their debut in, in the '36 election, and they all got it right. George Gallup was the best self-publicist so he's the one that people have normally heard of but Roper and Crosley also debuted their polls at that election also got it right ironically Gallup's polls weren't actually that accurate he got uh, Roosevelt the uh, the Democrat support wrong by seven percentage points which most of the time you'd say is a bit of a polling disaster but what he predicted was a landslide Roosevelt actually got even more of a landslide and so, of course, nobody really minded about that that error. It was the fact that they'd got the winner right and the Literary Digest and got it wrong. And that's such an important thing, is that when people say, oh, the pollsters mm. got it wrong, actually, if they get it wrong but call call the outcome right, nobody remembers. Exactly. So the polls, you know, in, 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 I'm sure we'll come on to mm. it, but, you know, in general elections and referendums that happened since, you know, the, the um, uh, margin of error... Mm. Could, it could only be two or three mm. points, and it's very close. They mm. could be very, very yeah. close. But if they were two points the other way, absolutely, they'd yeah. have called it right. Yeah. And 1997 was a great example of that, that people don't think of 97 as being a bad election for the polls in the UK, but they predicted a big Labour win. Labour did get a big win, but it was actually quite a lot different from what a lot of the polls uh, were saying. So had that been a close election, it would have been, oh, the polls were awful, because you know, it was, even, you know, it was a, not quite as big a landslide as the polls were saying, still a landslide. In a sense, who cares? Yeah. Um, and it, you're, interestingly, this, uh, in 1936, we were talking about, you know, how many people do you need? They ha So they sent out 10 million questionnaires to their readers yeah. and 2.27 million replied. Exactly. You can see why if you don't know how polling works, that sounds... Look, you've talked to... You've got answers from nearly 3 million people. Of course your answer's going to be right. You can. So it was a real shock. Um, and I think probably privately a huge amount of relief, maybe not a shock to George Gallup, but a huge amount of relief to him and the other pollsters that their newer methodology talking to a tiny fraction of that, that number of people got it right. But what Literary Digest could have done is mm. taken that two mm. point, uh, two, seven million people, asked them when they were doing their questionnaire, how old are mm. you? Where do you live? What do you do? Mm. What's your income? And then done a bit of waiting. I mean, waiting all two million would have probably taken quite a long time in those days. <laughs> yeah, no computers to but, do it. But if if they were basically coming back and they're all 65-year-old men who live in mm. Texas, then they, they, should have they known, might yeah. have thought, oh, hang on, this might not be representative of teenagers in California. Yeah, they had two problems. One was their sampling was basically too Republican, but that was only about a third of the problem. The other two-thirds was a differential response rate so that people who were more likely to vote Democrat were less likely to respond to their survey. And that's the sort of non-differential -respo response rate problem that's really hard to deal with with waiting because you might have the right number of men, the right number of Texans, the right number of pensioners. But if you've got Republicans keener to respond than Democrats, you, you may well still not get your waiting right. And so in the same way that I, I joked about the Daily Express, mm. but over the Express, I mean, the, the Times web, mm. website runs polls. All that tells you is what did Times readers at yeah. that moment think? Yeah, and that can be interesting. It's interesting. You know, it's, exactly, it's, you know, if, if Times readers were to overwhelmingly say that, for example, they think Britain should have nothing whatsoever to do with helping the Ukrainian government, that wouldn't be a scientific poll, but that would be quite a surprising result. It, and yeah. that would be worth checking, well, it would did the Russian bots get at the poll? Or, yeah. It would tell you something. It just wouldn't tell you what yeah. the country was thinking. Mm. Right, let's fast forward a bit now. We are coming back to the UK, 1970. Mm. Ted Heath for the Conservatives, Harold Wilson for Labour, and Heath was not expected to win. I think that this is very important, and everybody here would certainly agree, that we've been passing through a period of disillusionment with government. 
and this is particularly true of the young. The reason for it, of course, is that so many promises were given uh, by the Labour Party and then broken. As Ted Heath there whipping the mm. nation into a frenzy. <laughs> um, Mark Pack, uh, this was sort of the UK's first mm. big polling disaster. Yeah, the polls in Britain had started in 1945 and they'd, unlike pundits, had got the 45 election right. So they'd had a good run. They seemed to be a good source of information. But ahead of the 1970 election, over all the picture was suggesting Labour would get, Harold Wilson would get re-elected. Turned out to be a Tory victory. And so it was the Waterloo of the polls, as David Butler christened it. It was a bit of a disaster. Um, and it was a particular disaster because it was the first election at which newspapers who commissioned polls had relaxed the copyright on the polls. So newspapers were able to report each other's polls as well. And, for example, a third of the Times front pages during the election featured polls. So polls were the really big thing in that election. And then they got it horribly wrong. And it's... It's hard to give a simple answer. In fact, if you read my book, you'll probably b b have even less of an idea as to why the polls got it wrong in 70. <laughs> so because, it ringing in Dawson. It, well, because one of the common theories, I sort of have a go at demolishing, that it wasn't just a matter of there was a late swing, that, you know, if you look at the yeah, exact yeah. dates when polls were done, that, that story doesn't stand up. But I think what 1970 illustrates is that when the polls go wrong, it's often a lot of different small factors, which most of the time you get one thing a bit wrong one way and it counterbalanced by something being a bit wrong the other way. In 1970, really unluckily for the pollsters and the public, those areas all ended up lining up in one direction. So they all pushed the polls way off. And it's a bit like, you know, if you go to your doctor for a, a really thorough health checkup, you know, the doctor will inspect you and find all sorts of things that might be a bit wrong, that might cause a problem. And you never can be quite sure which is the exact precise one that's causing the ailment. But, you know, it's a good idea to try and deal with all of the problems. And so the, the reaction of the polling industry to that 70 disaster was to make quite a few changes to try and improve their methodology. And they did have then a, a good run in subsequent elections. But it is still a bit of a mystery. And I think the key lesson and therefore is it's very rarely the case there's just one simple explanation that's that's the be-all and end-all and so be suspicious of pundits touting just one polling story and i suppose actually you're 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 trying to 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 um use science mm. on human beings mm. and herding them into you know quite often you know i remember looking into the details of polls before mm. where you know lib dems who voted leave mm. ukippers who voted remote you know these are human beings some of them are a bit hard to predict they don't all do the thing that you always expect so it, it, it's it's a it, oh yeah they, they say there's a huge amount of wonderful variation i mean as you say the ukip lib dem swing voters are a real group of people that yeah, exist yeah. but i think to anyone interested in politics it's completely baffling that yeah. there can be a ukip lib dem swing voter because actually they're probably people who aren't that interested in politics mm. um but yeah i mean to go from so the polls back then predicting uh labor up to 12 points mm. at, uh, ahead of the tories and then the tories won uh, with a lead of 3.5%. The Times journalist George Clark wrote the election would be remembered as the occasion when the people of the United Kingdom hurled the findings of the opinion polls back in the faces of the pollsters. Something that I think we might discuss uh, some of the things <laughs> happening, uh, coming up. Right, we move on now. This is the third polling disaster with Mark Pack. We reach 1992. Neil Kinnock was expected to win comfortably against John Major. I think people in this country want to be convinced. They want to know what someone stands for, what their policies are, what they would mean, and how they would carry them out. Another great Tory leader there, whipping, mm. whipping us up into, uh, into a frenzy. Uh, once again, Neil mm. Kinnock was on course to win mm. uh, in 1992. Was it the pollsters? Did the campaign make a difference? What went wrong this time? Yeah, I mean, this was really dramatic because it looked like it would be a bit close, but that Labour probably would, would win, and so people were... You know, sort of on the edge of their seats, and then the exit poll pointed towards, yeah, probably a Labour victory. And then the first few results started coming in, and then, oh, crikey, maybe it's not going to be a Labour victory. And then the famous victory for the sadly now late David Amos in Basildon and his huge grinning face on being announced having successfully held the seat for the Tories, was really the the, you know, the visual image of the polls getting it wrong. They Polls had said he should lose, and there was he, hugely grinning and happy, having, having won. And it was really probably a mix of three things. One was there was some late swing, late swing away from Labour in the election. There was some faulty sampling, partly because 92 was, pollster still had to work with the 1981 census, because the 1991 census data wasn't yet available. So they're waiting how many, you know, what proportion of different groups and population should you wait to? They didn't have up-to-date information. They got some of that wrong. And then also there was, and this is a bit more controversial, but it certainly seems that for some pollsters, there was a problem with what was called the shy Tory effect, that some Tories were just less keen on taking part in polls, a bit more embarrassed about maybe admitting they were Tory because it was a rather unfashionable thing 
to be Tory in, in 1992, at least until the election result came in. So again, mix of different, mix of different things. Um, and all of them meant that afterwards, a lot of people felt, well, just the polls have given us the wrong story about the election. But in fairness to the pollsters, there were a lot of elections between 1970 and 92 when they had got it right. Well, it's a fascinating thing. And in fact, this weekend is 30 <clears throat> years since that 1992 general election. And tomorrow, Patrick McGuire's filling in for me. Times Red Box editor uh, is going to be here between 10 and 1. And for his big thing tomorrow, he's going to be speaking to Neil Kinnock and the former Tory party chair, Chris Patton, who uh, ran the campaign but obviously lost his seat. To the Liberal Democrats. To the Liberal Democrats. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Uh, back when the Lib Dems were good. We are doing Polling Unpacked. It's the title of a new book by Mark Pack. Uh, he's author. He's also president of the Liberal Democrats. He's been looking at the whole history of polling. And he joins me. He's still with me in the studio. Uh, Mark, we reached 2016. Mm. Not a good year for pollsters. No. Well, let's, as we're doing it in chronological audio, uh, let's uh, start with one of the big mm. early disasters for polling in 2016. This is, should be a British passport. It says European Union on it. All right? I think, to make this country safer, we need to get back British passports. Oh, such a big issue, that. Um, uh, of course, the Brexit mm. referendum in 2016, of the 168 polls carried out, ahead, carried out ahead of the EU referendum, only a third predicted a leave vote. What went wrong? Yeah, I mean, the polls weren't that badly off this time around. If you look at their final figures, they had remain on 52%, leave on 48%, and it was the other way around. So a couple of, you know, four points out each way, which is not a massive error. It's the sort of error you should expect on average one time in six. But, you know, we all, and I include myself in that, I think, looked at the polls and, and most people took a much heavier chance of a remain victory than in hindsight we should have. And what seems to have been a problem there was particularly that there are people less interested in politics, less likely to vote usually in elections, less likely to respond to polls. Actually, there's a, a good chunk of them were quite energised by the referendum campaign and decided to come out and vote. And therefore, that was enough to tip polls from being fairly close to just being that bit sufficiently off that they'd got the, the winner wrong in, in what was a close race. But one of the lessons I think to take from it is, you know, if you've got looking at something like 52, 48 percentage figures, you should, that's a one in six chance it's going to be the other way around. That might sound quite low, but if you had a revolver, six empty, five empty chambers, one bullet in it, you'd be thinking, <gasps> one in six could happen. One in six could happen. And actually, trajectory is important mm. as well. Mm. That actually during the course of the campaign, uh, Remain sort of started that year ahead mm. and it got narrower and narrower and narrower as we got closer. So you sort of think, well, if the if the vote had been a couple of weeks later, the pollsters would have probably, you know, if the trajectory had continued, mm. they might have picked it up. Yeah, and in fact, I mean, you mentioned the polls overall, but if you look just at the ones in June, they were almost exactly 50-50 split. It was 14 had Remain in the lead, 16 had Leave in the lead, one had it tied, and one had two different methodologies and you could pick either Remain or Leave in the lead. So, you know, it was almost exactly split, the polls, in the last couple of weeks. Do you think, given that uh, the majority of politicians in Westminster mm. were reporting mm. Remain, uh, supporting Remain, uh, in terms of sort of the what we'd probably call the out of touch mm. metropolitan elite chattering classes uh, who sit in glass buildings like this in London, Remain was an overwhelming uh, feature. Uh, was there sort of optimism bias or just wanting to believe the polls that showed Remain were going to win, disbelie therefore disbelieving the others? Yeah, I think there was definitely a bit of wanting one particular result and therefore people focusing on things like how often in referendums you see a swing towards the status quo at the last moment. So there was a lot of talk about the academic research that shows that and very little talk about the one in six chance that you should expect based on those figures, the result will go the other way. And I think that reflects when people want a particular outcome, you tend to look for things that make that outcome more likely rather than tend to look for things that make it less likely. And so as you, as you say, because the media and Westminster bubble overall was so heavily remain, that almost certainly did skew things. And given, because there were so many, many polls, over 168, um, what impact then does polling have on the campaign? Because mm. clearly campaigning could, could shift the polls, but then polls, if it looks like the polls are narrowing, that can then have an impact on people thinking, well, what I thought was a thing which was never going to happen, actually maybe it might yeah. happen, and so that might then influence how you're going to vote. I mean, in that sense, I guess the, the pollsters have a fairly good alibi with the Brexit referendum because the story they told was that, oh, it's looking close, but Remain will probably win. But, it, but there was clearly it was looking close-ish. And that almost certainly helped produce the very high turnout in the referendum. So in that sense, the pollsters may have got the, made the outcome a surprise for us, but at least they mobilised people knowing correctly that it's going to be a close thing. I think much more problematic is things like 
um, the 2015 election where the polls pointed towards a hung parliament and then it wasn't a hung parliament. And then in hindsight, you say, well, maybe that election would have been reported a bit differently if we'd had more accurate polls in it. But at least in the referendum, the basic story of it's close was true. Uh, because actually the, the debate around 2015 mm. was, uh, you know, Ed Miliband's going to win or it's going to mm. be a hung parliament. There was very little scrutiny of what does a Conservative exactly. majority government look like, including the promise of an EU referendum. Yeah, indeed. Uh, and indeed, uh, the, the, the demise of the Lib Dems from the coalition. Uh, let's move on then to, the, uh, to our final party disaster. This is another one from 2016. Mm. And I don't know, the polls now, a poll just came out where essentially we're even, and I'm feeling it. You know, when I went to New Hampshire, I wasn't supposed to win, right? Yes, Donald Trump winning the 2016 mm. US presidential election. Was it a polling disaster? Sort of. But in fairness to the pollsters, the national polls in the US in 2016 pretty much got it right. You look at the average just before polling day in the US, uh, the real clear politics average had it as Clinton 47, Trump 44. The actual result was Clinton 48, Trump 46. Pretty much dead on. But two big mistakes. One was lots of people assumed that if you're ahead in the vote, you'll therefore win the Electoral College. And actually, that isn't what happened. Easy mistake to make, because although everyone sort of technically knew that wasn't the case, the previous time it happened in 2000, which was this really weird election with Florida and the hanging chads and all of that, and the last time before that had been 1888. So there was just this assumption, oh, if Clinton's ahead in the poll, surely she's going to win. So that was mistake number one. Mistake number two was there were some state polls that were really badly off, particularly in a trio of northern US states that Trump won by unbelievably small margins. Had he not won them, he would have lost... The polls had Clinton doing well in them, partly because of late swing, partly because of undersampling uh, people with lower levels of formal education. Those state polls were quite badly wrong. And therefore, you know, the national picture polls were right. But because the state polls being wrong, people had drawn the wrong conclusion, thinking Clinton was pretty much, you know, very, very likely to win. There were all sorts of projections giving her 98 percent you know, type supposed certainty of winning, which you probably never should give that high a certainty on anything <laughs> in life. But... but so in a way, the polls, the national polls were right, some state polls were badly wrong, and the analysis all levered on top of it was was quite quite misleading. Again, the media class could not believe that Donald Trump would actually win, so that, that ends up influencing. Yeah, I mean, had, say, it been Mitt Romney as the Republican candidate and he'd been the shock winner, I think it would have been much less of a shock because the fact that it was yeah. Trump, such an exceptional, out-of-the-ordinary uh, candidate winning, that made it a real shock. And uh, we, we've talked about how after each shock, the pollsters changed what they do. Um, I mean, they were slightly better when it came to the 2019 mm. general election. You know, they predicted the Tories were going to win, mm. you know, comfortably, and they did. How much can we trust what the polls are telling us right now then? I think quite a lot, not 100% for the reasons we've just been yeah. running through these five failures. But across, you know, we've been talking about elections across near on 100 years across two countries, there have been huge numbers of elections and referendums and other votes that we've not talked about, in all of which the polls yeah, were pretty good. Yeah, we've just highlighted the high-profile failures. And so, overall, pollsters are much better than political pundits at getting it right. Um, apologies to political pundits who are listening <laughs> in, but I'm afraid that, you know, that you look at the research into the record of pundits, phew, go for a pollster over a pundit any day. But, you know, don't don't take it as absolute certainty. There will be you know, maybe it's one time in five, one time in six, where the polls will end up misleading you. But better to be well informed the rest of the time from them. So pay attention to them, but don't stake your life on them. <laughs> and just because, wait, now you're such an expert in polling. You've written a whole book about mm. polling. Why are the Liberal Democrats, of which you're president, of <laughs> not doing better in the polls? You should be able to game them. You should know how to do this. Yeah. Well, if if you um if you read some of the footnotes carefully, you'll you'll see me recanting some of my belief on a previous internal polling <laughs> that the Lib Dems have done. And um, but I think fundamentally, you know, the big challenge for smaller parties, including the Lib Dems, is one of grabbing public attention. And so there is often quite a gap between the potential of what a party can do and what it can then pull off when there's an actual election on, and you see like we saw in the by-elections last year and so on, versus what people are thinking when they're asked by a pollster, when they're not really thinking about politics. They don't really think much about politics at all, let alone thinking about the Lib Dems. But give them a few weeks of Lib Dem leaflets coming through their letterbox every other day. As we saw in North Shropshire, you can get a very, very different outcome. 
So would you would you expect a, a massive change in the Lib Dems prospects ahead of the next general election? I think you look at a lot of those blue wall parliamentary constituencies, there's really good prospects for there to be a very significant increase in the number of Lib Dem MPs in the next election. But a lot of that is going to be down to that local campaigning to buck the national picture, to make people give people a, a reason to think about the Lib Dems in their seat in a way that it's, you know, obviously Times Radio is wonderfully generous in its coverage to the Lib Dems, but it's always a bit of a struggle to get national media coverage for a smaller party. Uh, just like you've got a copy of it, but mm. you, you mentioned that I'm in it. I've not seen, you, a, I've not seen a copy yeah, of it. Yeah, you, you feature in a footnote. You feature in a footnote. In a good way or a bad way? Um, in a <laughs> neutral way. I, I, I just use the example of that when people cover polls, they often slip from talking about the past tense to the current tense. So a yeah. poll might tell you Labour's gone up four points. Yeah. But it's really common for journalists to then rewrite that as as the polls showing Labour is going up, as if that's something that's still happening. So you've picked up something that and, I've... And I used one example from uh, from the Red Box early morning email of of, uh, of the past well, tense. it was five. Versus, uh, versus current tense. But yeah, but, I mean, it was written at 5am in the morning, yeah, probably, I mean, let, as let your, your let alibi. Me, let me off, let me off. <laughs> Mark, it's lovely to see you. It's Likewise. absolutely fascinating. Cause it's, yeah, it's, um, and it's a really good reminder that, you know, yes, we should listen to polls and, you know, follow them, but also, you know, a, a pinch of salt is always advisable. Lovely to see you. Mark Pack Thank there. You. Uh, his book, uh, Polling Unpacked, is out, out now in all, all good bookshops and other places. 